All right, let's talk about um, part five here, note markets and pricing models. I know some people had some questions about, hey, what we, you know, talk, tell me about the markets. Tell me about where we're at here, okay? So here's the thing. They can vary on price in a variety of reasons. They can vary based on popularity, market values, or closure time frames, location, inventory, okay? So popularity, I'll give you an example. If it's a very popular area like Austin, Texas, it's gonna be more expensive than say LaGrange, Texas, which is kind of out in the middle of nowhere here in Texas. Um, Miami can be a lot pricier than, um, you know, Homestead, which is down in the bottom part of Florida. San Diego, gonna be a lot more expensive than 29 Palms. All right, it's still gonna be both expensive in California, but it's gonna be a lot more expensive than say, you know, Texas or Columbus, Ohio, or Detroit, Michigan, All right? That also leads us to market values. If your market values, as, gonna, as we've seen increase over the last couple of years, hey, the market value of the houses are, are gonna increase too. There's a lot of demand in places because there's not much housing. It's also gonna be higher demand on the lower valued assets or on the non-performing assets, especially if it's in a shorter foreclosure time frame. It's less than six months to foreclose, expect to be a little bit more expensive, okay? Like I said, longer foreclosure time frames should be cheaper for you, should be a discount. If you wanna buy something in New York, I'm gonna pay really cheap for it because of the foreclosure time frames. Otherwise, I'm not gonna waste my time, okay? Population is also important. Uh, when you're starting off, you're probably gonna get some lists of some stuff that's rural, okay? I would look at the how many people are in a town. Just because you can get a deal at five cents on the dollar doesn't mean it's a good thing if there's only 500 people in the city. So I like to try to target the areas where there's at least 50,000 or if not more uh, residents. Now, one of the big things I've talked about in the past is, uh, and I'll probably talk about more about this year, is targeting college towns. Well, I want to make sure that there's other employers in town besides college towns. Because a lot of cities I would have bought in six months ago are kind of vacant right now. All right. So you need to know what kind of effect that has on rents, on vacancies and stuff like that too, if that's it ends up being one of your strategies. Okay. Um, you know, if your landlord, if the, the owner of the property they're buying the note on can't rent the property, they're probably not going to make the mortgage payment as well too. Okay. So keep that in mind as well. Location. Like I said, you want to be near the city. You don't want to be out in the middle of freaking nothing. And this is why we like to map our assets uh, really quickly with Batch Geo or Google Maps to see kind of where they located compared to if, if Google Earth has not mapped your property, excluding that it's in a gated community or somewhere like that, if it's that rural and you can't see it, yeah, it's probably good. Just go ahead and remove it off your list. Okay. Um, inventory. If there's stuff, <clears throat> if there's great stuff, you know, you're going to find in my example, Austin, very low inventory here for stuff available. More availability in San Antonio, more availability in Dallas or Houston. That's gonna make it more expensive in specific areas. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you're just looking at markets in cities that don't have much inventory, then probably go do something else. Okay, now here's why I, I put this out here. The most expensive note markets, California, Arizona, Texas, Nevada, Georgia, really anything on the West Coast, that's gonna be your most expensive note markets. And by most expensive, I mean you're higher priced as far as percentage of UPB, okay? Yeah, New York is, is the most expensive real estate, but it's a little bit cheaper, but you also have a longer foreclosure time frame. People like, you know, like the faster non-judicial states for the most part, so keep that in mind. Most expensive note markets. So if I see something in this states, which is great, I'll take a look at it. But for the most part, I know I'm probably not gonna have it successfully be too pricey compared to what I can buy something else. I mean, look at the, I buy one note in California, I can buy a block in St. Louis. I can buy a block in Columbus. I can maybe buy, buy a whole zip code in Detroit. Eh, just joking, but I can leverage my risk across a much more assets depending on, on the price here, expensive side of the business, okay? Where we see the most inventory as of right now, this really hasn't changed. Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri. Those are really the top five states that we see the most amount of, of product in. Um, you know, we'll see stuff in the Carolinas as well. Um, saw a lot of stuff from Florida a few years back. As Florida rebound, it was less and less, became more expensive. We'll probably see some more inventory in Florida here. It's going to get hit hard in the next six months as well, too. Okay. 
Uh, and the primary stuff that you're going to see is usually a hundred grand or less values at a hundred grand or less where you can see the most amount of inventory start getting above a hundred grand. That doesn't mean you won't see stuff. It's just usually it's going to be at roughly, you know, 50, 60% of value for much of those higher priced assets. You get below a hundred and you get often bigger discounts because it's, um, if you're gonna need a bigger discounts because the cost to foreclose on a hundred thousand dollar property is the same roughly as a 300,000. Okay. So often a bank will say, okay, uh, 300,000 is worth 300. Okay. 60, 65 cents. If we've done most of the, the heavy lifting, most of the foreclosure or faster foreclosure time frame, you have to make, you see if it makes sense. But, you know, that's why I like to look at below hundred because especially below 75, below 60,000, you start seeing some better discounts in the fifties or below. Uh, pricing models. All right. Take a swig here. <laughs> This is to be a guide. This is not hard fast, okay? Because pricing models change a little bit. But we'll start with the easiest one, performing notes. If you're gonna buy a performing note, all right, especially in a loan that was once non-performing, somebody bought it as a non-performing and they got it re-performing, all right? You can buy performing or re-performing notes somewhere at eight to a 15% cap rate return investment based on the cash flow divided by the price. Okay, uh, and the easy thing for me is re-performing. I'll take 12 months of payments, making sure that they did make 12 months of payments straight, divided by my offering uh, to get a roughly 15% ROI. I like it better than 15%, but that's the thing you want to keep in mind. It's a pretty easy formula to run there down for you. If you 12 months of payments divided by 0.15 to equal your, your offering price should be. It's pretty simple, take, make sure your taxes are paid. But always, always, always make sure it's got at least 12 months of payments. Most of the time, a lot of sellers will try to say, oh, it's, they, they want to do a mod. What well, doesn't mean they're approved for a mod yet. It doesn't mean they made 12 months of payments, so I'm not going to pay that. If you're going to do that, then remove it. Remove it from your offering. Okay. Uh, Non-performing notes with negative equity. Well, that means they're upside down. They owe 150. The house is worth 100. There's a stair step pricing point model that kind of works that way. So basically, if you just take a stair step and start at the top, anything $50,000 in value or more, okay, as is value, not ARV, $50,000 or more is roughly going to be around 55% of value minus taxes. Okay, so 50 ks and above, value roughly about 55% minus taxes. You get in the 40s range, 40 to 49. Okay, 45% of value minus taxes. So if you get something in the 30s, 35% of value minus taxes. Any below $30,000 in value, then you're looking at, I wouldn't pay above 25 cents on the dollar minus taxes owed. Well, Scott, that means you're only gonna pay four grand or five grand for a $20,000 asset? Yeah, huh. I'm not gonna pay more than that because if I had a foreclose or put a roof on or do some other things, you know, I want to make sure I've got plenty of profit on the back end side. It's worth my while. Otherwise, it gets to be too small. You got servicing costs. You got other things to go along with. So making sure that's important. Now, if it's uh, reverse, there is equity. All right. And by equity, I mean more than the payoff amount because you take the back payments and add that to your unpaid balance. That'll give you the payoff roughly. Well, I want to make sure there's equity above that. Okay. Um, roughly most sellers, most banks, most private lenders are going to sell their, uh, non-performing notes with equity. They're going to try to get 80 to 95 cents on the dollar off of an unpaid balance, not payoff, but unpaid balance. Okay. Yes. You can look at the payoff. If there's a ton of equity above the payoff. Okay, great. I'll look at the payoff. But for the most part, I'm going off the UPB 80 to 95%. And I really, I just most of the time avoid notes with a ton of equity, just not worth my time. Now look, I bought a bunch of contract for deeds with equity, but I got them at 35 cents of the dollar. They were really non-performing, okay? Hey, that's a different uh, asset class because they were lower valued assets. But you start seeing higher valued assets above 50, above 100. Yeah, banks aren't gonna take too big a discount on performance, uh, non-performing with equity. Same thing on the performance side. Uh, currently junior liens, I, I'm not a junior lien guy, no offense. Um, I think Julian's and not my just opinion, but other people that have, have told me the same thing. They're overpriced right now. 
So until the market changes, the market values drop, junior liens are just way overpriced. There's not really that big a deal. The reason junior liens were so um, valuable to a lot of people is you could pick them up really cheap when, there was, when they were upside down. Well, there's no equity or they're negative equity, you'd pick them up really cheap and then the whole plan was try to work it out of some sort. But um, I'm just not a big fan of, of junior liens. Yes, it's cheaper to raise capital for them, but it's also harder to raise capital because you're in a junior lien position. So, okay. Uh, commercial notes are going to totally vary by rate and asset classes. Okay. Totally going to change varies in apartment complexes. is going to be valued differently than self storage. Self storage would be different valued than a strip mall. Uh, it's going to, value differently by a big box store, okay? Office medical, so you gotta really know what's going on with the asset class um, so that your numbers don't make sense. Like I'll give you an example, an apartment complex, you're gonna look at a 40 to 50% expense ratio. Whereas in like a self storage facility, maybe 25 to 30% or less expense ratios. So you gotta look at that, figure it out what kind of cap rates. I mean, commercial is all about rents and it depends on what kind of asset classes and, and you know an industrial is going to be priced differently than the warehouse be priced differently than apartment complex okay or class a office space like it's across the street here for me so the best thing about commercial and pricing point is figuring out what's going on talking to a broker in that class and adding you know really picking the brains of somebody who's done that type of asset class before okay one of the things that we did when, when we were first got into the note game we get that's what we bought primarily was commercial notes um, cause that's what was available from the, our asset classes and, we, and commercial notes are going to be available faster than the residential side, just so that you guys know that. All right. We are starting to see that. So spend the time, talk to somebody, take some training on a specific asset class. If you're big into self storage, Hey, take a class from, uh, uh Scott Myers or Stacy Rossetti or somebody who understands that, that you, you can learn the specifics of over, uh, Aaliyah Ott or Terry Garner, you know, Take a class to learn about the specific asset class. It's different than the residential. Residential side, it's pretty easy to get comps because you're just going to check values. Commercial, you got to look at comparables, what's going on in the market, vacancy factors, a lot more commercial side. It's also a, a longer due diligence time, and we'll get to that later on. Whereas a, you're buying a one-off note from a hedge fund, you may have a week to 10 days to close. Okay, With the bank, it may be 30 days. Commercial notes, you know, 30, 45, 90 days from the time that you um, – you make your initial bid or acceptance. Okay. Occupied assets have a higher percentage versus vacant assets. Yeah, vacant assets, it's been vacant for a while. It's probably needs some work. It probably needs, uh, gonna be have to clean up on the inside. Okay. Especially if the, the bar moved out and left, you know, left you a, a lunch in the fridge. Okay. But with no power. Or they didn't flush the toilets. Or they just left all their crap there for you to clean up. Okay. Occupied assets, I will pay a little bit more so versus vacant assets because I know, hey, it's probably in better shape. That's not saying somebody isn't a messy liver, but I'm probably not going to have to, you know, replace the sheetrock most of the time. I'm probably, um, you know, the air conditioner is still there. The copper is still there. The electrical is still there if somebody's living in it. Not a squatter, but the bar is still in it. I will pay a little bit better. A vacant asset, you know you're going to replace something and you should always try to get internal views of a vacant asset by having I mean, your realtor go peek in the windows or somebody on your team, go take a look at that asset. A vacant asset, a drive by, you can see if the power's on, you can call the city. There's a lot of due diligence, you can check that out there. But occupied assets are always usually gonna be in better shape. You can tell a lot by the interior, by the exterior. If there's you know, toys, what's the back door look like? And there's a lot more exit strategies. You have your full gamut of 10 exit strategies in, a, in an occupied asset, whereas in a vacant asset, Probably maybe deed in lieu or foreclosure for the most part. Rarely are you going to have somebody, or short sale, rarely are you going to have somebody move back into a property that's left already. It's happened a few times, but for the most part, not going to happen. Okay. And like I said, vacant assets have less capital expenditures of paying the HVAC, roof, plumbing, wire, whatever. You're probably going to replace at least one of those in a vacant asset. All right. Um, bidding. Uh, you're going to always do a percentage of UPB, unpaid principal balance or principal balance uh, versus fair market value minus taxes. Of. That's when you make a bid. Hey, this is my percentage of UPB. Make sure that number is higher than what the value is. Make sure that that number of UPB makes sense to you when you compare it to the value of the property. So I'll give an example. Say a house uh, borrows 100, but it's only worth 50. Well, I'm not going to make 50% of UPB. That would be a $50,000 Offering well, if the house is only worth fifty. I'm not going to pay 100% of fair market value. So you want your percentage of UPB 
they'll still be a really good percentage when it comes to your fair market value as is not ARV throw ARV out we don't use ARV you want to make sure you're probably not exceeding 50 60 percent of as is fair market value off the percentage so keep that in mind of course minus taxes owed all right and that's your kind of your bidding process for that aspect of things okay questions about pricing bidding We're moving right along. I know I've covered a lot. Hey, Charles. Hey, Cody. Colleen. Marianne. Mike. Omar. Any questions from any of you? Uh, I'm bidding. Okay, so. Okay, great question here. So Jeff asked a question about bidding. B basically, okay, so let's say I get a spreadsheet. Okay, I get a spreadsheet in from a bank. And they've all got, they're all over encumbered. They all owe more than the property's worth. Okay, but the bank tells me, okay, we'll accept somewhere around 50% of UPB. Well, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go on that spreadsheet, insert a column, and I'm going to put 50% of UPB in the number of formula, 50% times UPB. You want to run it all the way down. And then I'm gonna go over, all right, and then pull values. I can jump on Zillow, I'm gonna pull on Trulia, I'm gonna jump on notepros.com and drop that spreadsheet to get values, rough estimated values. I'm not gonna pay for BPOs right off the bat. I don't pay for due diligence things until I've got an approved final accepted offer, everybody. It's a big thing, okay? Never pay for a BPO, never pay for an O&E until you've got an accepted offering and it's under contract, okay? Use your online values. If Tommy tells you you gotta do all your due diligence before bidding, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna drop, you know, a uh, hundred dollars on O and E for ten assets. I'm gonna spend a thousand bucks, so I know I'm gonna spend. You're gonna give me some time, okay? There should always be a due diligence period afterwards as well. We'll get to that later on. But anyway, going back to the point, I'm gonna run the numbers down. I'm gonna put values. I'm gonna look. Okay, what is this fifty percent of UPB equal to as a percentage of fair market value? I'm gonna run that second formula all the way down, okay? And of course, what I'm gonna do first, besides running formulas, then I'm gonna go back and get rid of the assets that I don't want, the cities, the states. I'm in this spreadsheet, I'm gonna delete. I'm not gonna hide them, I'm gonna just delete them. I'm not gonna waste my time. The last thing I need to do is run formulas and unfilter something and I got assets that I'm not making bids on, screwing stuff up. So I wanna take that list of like 200 and reduce it down to my top 20, top 40, top 50 assets, okay? So if I, I run the number and I see that, okay, this 50% of UPB ends up still less than 60% of fair market value. Okay, let's look at the states. Okay, vacant assets. Okay, let's do a quick search, see if it's vacant or occupied. Let's look at the last 12 months of payment stream. If somebody's made payments, hit and miss here in the last 12 months, okay, it's probably occupied. If it's completely nothing, and then it's gonna be probably a difficult asset to do. All right, so let's look at the ones and focus on the ones that have made the most amount of payments in the last 12 months. Okay, great. Do you see we start filtering this down here? And I look, okay, let's start looking at the assets. What does it look like? Let's take 12 months of P&I times, take principal interest payment times 12, divide that by the offering number they want, and what type of return does that come up to? All right, it's above 20%, anything below 20%, we're going to have to adjust our bid down. So that's how we kind of start finagling the numbers to reduce it down to the numbers. And then what I do, then I just send it in. Hey, and here's my bids on the tape. Here's the, the 20 that we'll make an offering on. And I'll just simply, I say, here's the number. They get rid of my formulas. I say, hey, I'll just say, here's the, your tape and here's my bids. I don't want them to look at and say, oh, 35% ROI. Oh yeah, that's great. No, here's my bids. If it's a really low bid or I see high taxes out, and you can always check taxes for free by going to Netra online and 99% of the counties Metro online, we'll sh share that link later on, but you, you look at that and I just send the spreadsheet in with just the assets. There's a couple people that send in bids to me and they just filter it and it drives me bonkers. But you send it in a spreadsheet so they can look at it simply easy and then just waiting. That's a bid. No, usually you're not usually sending proof of funds, not usually having to send in an LOI. It's literally, hey, here's a spreadsheet. Let me know how I rank. And then it's waiting. They accept or counter and go from there. Very, very simple. Here's the deals I'm looking at making an offering on. If they come back, like if it's from a bank, they may want an official LOI. And all it is is a one page 
you know, one to two page thing. Here's the one we're submitting the letter of intent. Here's our bids. Here's what we would require before closing. Here's how long we'd want for closing and going from there. Pretty simple. This is an, this is what I'm trying to get at. Bidding, people ask that question, oh my God, when I get a bid? It's pretty simple. It's a spreadsheet and email back and forth. With a single asset, you just send it back to here's my number. If Now here's the thing too. If they give you a price point when it comes to bidding and the, there doesn't make any sense and you're going to bid below that, you have to give the reason why. Hey, this needs work or hey, it's got a hole in the roof or hey, a hole in the side of the house or long foreclosure process or they owe five grand in back taxes and you have to pay that, okay? If they started foreclosure process, that means we'll add a little value. If they haven't started foreclosure process, if they're 90% of the way through foreclosure, it's going to be priced closer to REO pricing. But they haven't started, and those are some things to keep in mind. So hopefully that answers your questions. No, Wesley, Wesley, you're going to have to get just used to going through. If you want to create your own ROI calculator, by all means, do this. Do so. Okay. It just takes experience. You, 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 you gotta have to work through them. Just start working through them. Um, Cody Cox says, how do you deal with a tape that has no property address only in the city state? How do you, but thank you very much for asking that Cody. That would be called a sanitized list. If you get a list in from a bank or asset manager that has no properties and remove the properties, just don't waste your time. That's called a sanitized list. You can't pull due diligence on city state and zip codes. I'm sorry, don't do that. Don't waste your time. It's a sanitized list that's sorry, I'm not interested. Please send me the full list. Now you might need to sign a non-disclosure agreement to get that full list with the full addresses, but I wanna to try to have at least addresses and, and borrower name too, to making sure I can check taxes. If there's no borrower's names, okay, but I'm always gonna double check the taxes to see if there's been a, a tax or anything like that. But that's the most important thing. If you don't have an addresses, it's not worth wasting your freaking time. And I don't care what they say, hey, I'll, Oh, it's always, no, sorry. Nobody's going to pull comps. Nobody's going to trust comps off a of city, state, and zip code and what you tell me. Sellers are liars. I don't care if they pull comps. You still need to pull your own comps. Okay? Because they're joker brokers, Wesley. If they send you a sanitized list, they may just be recycling lists from that they got from somebody else. So they don't even know the addresses. Okay? It happens. A lot of joker brokers. Why well, don't you go around me? You can find out who the lender is by looking at the address. I'm gonna just well, then send me a non-disclosure agreement. I'll sign that and send it back. Don't waste my time with a sanitized list. It happens, so trust me on that. Cody can vouch for that as well. All says, so far, so good. Okay. <laughs> uh, good stuff. All right, let's do this. I think we're at uh, the end of session one. Let's take a uh, our first break, our, our 30 minutes, right at 11 o'clock. So we're doing on time here. We look at, we on track, we running a little fast. We're a little bit ahead, it's okay. We'll cover some more questions. Oh, well, yeah, if you do, if you want to build your little chart for st or stepping for negative equity, yeah, that's fine. But what more than anything else, what I do with that, Wesley, is when I get a spreadsheet in and it has me of values, you know, where I, and you can run value, you can use Note Pros or just use Zillow or ePraisal and just put, you know, just your you know, VA type in your, you know, put in your estimated values and then just re-rank it by values, high to low. And then you just run your formula from 59 you know, 59 to 50, okay? That's 55% of that is roughly. You know, 40, if the, in the 40s, you know, run it at 45%. It's a simple thing to do, okay? Yeah. If they're upside down, just go off, the. you know, like I said, make your bid off the lesser of UPB or fair market value, whichever is less, not, as is, not ARV, all right? Good question, though. All right, let's... Question. Reverse mortgages, you're not, okay, here, here's this thing about reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages, you're gonna price it as an REO. You're not gonna buy off on it because with a reverse mortgage, it's a different vehicle than a traditional 30 year mortgage. Reverse mortgage is more like an annuity on a house. So on a reverse mortgage, it's gonna be basically, A, you're gonna to have to foreclose and then sell it as an REO. You're not gonna have a lot of equity. The borrowers are often gonna have zero equity 
on that because it, it worked as an annuity, pulled the value out of things. So you're, you're not going to modify that loan because the borrower is going to be deceased. So in a reverse mortgage aspect of things, most of the time they aren't making payments on that. So that's a, a, a reverse mortgage is going to be a foreclosure. So looking at 70% if it's in good shape, you know, or less depending on where it's located. Good question though, Wesley. A reverse mortgage list is a property play. It's not a modification play. It's not a, a cash flow play. All right. Take our first 30 minute break, everybody. 